Today, you are going to get a front row seat to the memorable Springbok career of Obani Bobo. Obani, welcome to Front Row Rugby. It's great to have you. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm honored and privileged the fact that, um, as we were chatting before, 41st Springbok. I mean, uh, there's a loads of them, but uh, now to be part of this, that's very special for me. That's very kind of you. Now, before we begin our conversation, I'd like to take a look at the trivia question for this week. The Springboks did not play a single test match in 2020. In which previous year did that most recently happen? Now, if you know the answer to the question, you can put it in the comment section down below. We'll also find out if Hobani knows the answer, but we'll do that at the end of the conversation. Hobani, I want to begin with your high school career. I've read that you actually started out as a flank, and it was Nick Mallet's idea to move you into the center. What can you tell me about that? Uh, well, when I started playing rugby, just uh, starting to play, uh, my dad owned the butchery, which was... Uh, uh, made, meant that the meat was a bit cheap. So I started off as a tight end and uh, under 14s and learning the trick and the trades of the game, which I thought it was the best uh, sort of way to understand the game uh, and to get the fundamentals and to really understand why the big boys are on that field. So I was part of that crew. And, and then um, as I started growing up, I started becoming a bit quicker. I used to break off, beat my flanks to the ball and all of that. And then uh, to say that I must move to flank. So I started playing flank, which uh, I, I was uh, pleasantly surprised in terms of the progress that I made, which was instant. I uh, played first team when I was about uh, 15, turning 16, uh, on my first year open, which was then, uh, I think now it's like grade 10. And, and and that worked out well for me. And I got into the ACS schools and all of that. I remember then now uh, I was captaining of the ACS 19 side, going to a FIRA tournament and had a meeting with the former Springbok coach then, Nick Mallet, which was in, back in 98. And he said, you know what, you got this great skill set and, and, and all of that. you got the pace. I think you can live with the backs. Um, if you don't want to get frustrated and you want to play professional rugby as quickly as possible, maybe you should move to flank. And then he sort of gave me like his examples. is like, you know, Tony Cricker, it's probably the smallest Springbok flank that you have at the moment, but you are 10 kilograms lighter than he is. Can imagine now if you're going to give yourself that upheaval type of tough, tough uh, introduction to professional rugby. So I was like, you know, if the box coach thinks so, I'm going for it. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, why not hit the like button? You made your debut for the Springboks in 2003 against Scotland off the bench. Did Rudolf Strali talk to you in the week and give any indication that you would actually get on and get a chance? It was an interesting time. Uh, first getting called up um, the, the week before that, uh, being called up to the Springbok squad was uh, it's one of those wild whirlwind. It's, it's, it's an amazing sort of experience. And um, I sat on the bench in that first test in Durban, um, never ran onto the field. Uh, so you can imagine my disappointment. I had my dad there. I remember giving him the jersey after the game and uh, pity that I didn't get to use that jersey. Uh, and then um, at Alice Park the next week, um, I got called off from the bench. Um, there was, I mean, in those days, uh, squads were just a 50-man squad. There was no 23-man squad. So most of the time we used to feel like if you sit on the bench, someone has to maybe like have, have a official game or something this to happen to him to get off to the field because and it was just that pride I guess of back in those days no one wanted to sort of um, hand over caps uh, but running on at Alice Park a place where I've sort of enjoyed my junior rugby and a place that gave me professional career it was unbelievable I mean it was just on head of uh, I remember just taking my first touch of the ball and hitting a great line and I had a line break and it felt like as if a jumbo jet just shot out of the stadium. I've never heard noise and cacophony like that in my life. And my hairs on the back of my neck just rose. And I remember just being so wide, wildly awake. And my, all my senses were just wired up. And uh, what an experience. And I, and I loved every single moment of it. I know that the Springboks were actually struggling at that moment in 03. Um, and I know that obviously you were one of the new guys in the squad. But were you able to figure out what the problem was at the time? Well, at the time, I mean, 
you you in the Springbok squad. Um, the the only thing you you want to do is to make this the best and the most memorable time of your life. Um, whatever obstacles or challenges that are lied ahead, you, you I guess it was naivety, it was uh, ignorance, was bliss. Didn't have a clue. I didn't know that we were going through the turmoils. Yes, we could see that the results are not coming along, uh, and there was a whole lot of that. But I was a youngster, I was a junior. I was just trying to make sure that if I'm given a shot, uh, I make I take my my best foot forward and and make the most of it. And in that way, inspire with my performance and hopefully with the performance that will come with a, a much more uh, team orientated performance where we all can get the better results. So I, I guess you, you sort of shut yourself off and, and you just focus on your task at hand. I know that you picked up an injury in 03 and that prevented you from going to the World Cup. But did that also prevent you from going to Camp Stockdraut? Uh, well, the, um, the funniest bit, you, you'll think... <laughs> Um, I'm the one person who went through the whole uh, camp stardom. Um, I remember we went through it uh, the few uh, few days that we were there, uh, being announced going to the Springbok uh, camp and then uh, going to uh, to the bush and, and, and doing what was uh, a very different way of team building. Uh, camp Stardom went through the whole thing, and in the first warm up game that we played against the Cheetahs in Bloemfontein. Um, I, I tore my ligaments of my knee and my ACL was gone and I needed a knee, uh, reconstruction, which was, uh, it was unfortunate because I felt that I had worked myself into a position where I could have maximized my potential. So with that in mind, everyone has their own Kamp Staldrat story. What's yours? Um, uh, mine, um, just doesn't really put anything in good light, but, um, I uh, had a, a bit of a boxing match with uh, Louis Kuhn and uh, we got into the ring and uh, we decided to say, you know, a gentleman's agreement, we've got three minutes where we can just spot this thing out or we can just have a crack at it. And I thought we had the gentleman's agreement, but the first thing that he did was jab me in the nose. So I decided to use my Eastern Cape uh, skills of boxing, born close to Tanzania, where it's a boxing mecca of South Africa. I uh, went with a hook around the... Um, the chest and uh, brought his head down and then I could get my head, my fist through him and the uppercuts and everything and I guess it uh, didn't last that long. And I've actually been to Mdansani myself and, and as you say, uh, some of South Africa's greatest boxers actually come from there. Um, tell me, about a year later, Jake White had taken over and you were part of the squad again uh, on the end of year tour to the UK. I think you only got one chance and it was also off the bench. Why do you think in the Jake White era you didn't get more of a look in? Um, so what happened was uh, I just made it back onto the field. Uh, Jake called me out straight from an injury. And um, that was for my first sort of uh, ACL. And, and then I'd done my other one. So I had two ACLs. Um, that's good 18 months. So, so from 2003 till about 2005. I was trying to recover and, cut and get back to the best form and shape I could possibly can. Uh, I moved from the Lions, went to the Sharks, and um, and I was trying to make it back into the Springbok squad. Um, I sort of found a route uh, via playing sevens, which was, for me, quite, um, I guess, it was almost like trekking back and going to the start of my rugby career as a pro player. Um, I remember playing with Paul True, who was now there. The, the coach of the Blitzbox uh, and studying that culture and really bringing something that was important for the Blitzbox to be not just that uh, the, 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 the third wheel or the cousin of the Springboks, but to understand that it was representing your country, it was representing the Springboks. Uh, I think I fought for the pledge of the Springbok pledge and the honor so that the players can receive that once they make the Springbok the Blitzbox because I felt that if they could take that uh, and build a culture around that, it will bring more players who want to represent and, and become these pioneers of greatness, which they did the year after I left. And then a few years later, you were back in the Springbok squad again. This time, Peter de Villiers had taken over as coach. Uh, you were in the side that played against Italy at uh, Newlands. I was actually at that match, and I remember uh, not really the best of conditions. Um, but at that moment, did you think that maybe you were set for an extended run in the Springbok side? I sort of had to be uh, very much uh, a realist uh, and look at what was ahead of me and, and what was the competition looking like. And... For me, the most important bits was asking myself the question, can I play better rag enough rugby to get myself back into the national side? 
was the first time a fluke, was the third, second time a fluke. After the third time, I can come back from two knee reconstructions. Will I get a test match uh, for South Africa? And that was the, the biggest sort of thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to prove it to myself more than anyone else um, that I was capable of playing at that level. Uh, things didn't turn out like that. And sometimes there's combinations. There's things that are happening right on the field. You had two, you had World Cup winners all across the field. Uh, and it was going to be hard to, to kick the door down. Um, I know that Peter had a great relationship with uh, one of my best mates, A.D. Jacobs, and he was playing at the outside center. Jean de Villiers was there. You had uh, Morsi, Jacques Fourie. So it, I guess the competition was tough, and I sort of knew to myself that um, I wanted to play that test match, and it was in Cape Town. And, uh, I mean, my last test match and Audwin Dungani's first test match and the coincidence of this, the story is that we both went to the same primary school. I remember we were standing there and um, at the at the national anthem, and I was saying to him, "Can you imagine two boys from St. Patrick's Junior Secondary School in Umtata are standing in front and playing for South Africa at the same time, not knowing that it was going to be my last and his first?" But uh, I was just proud of that moment. Um, I, I, I was the kind of person who said to me myself, "You know what?" Rugby is a passport. It doesn't defy who I am. And it's a chance for me to, to explore uh, and go and travel and find uh, another sort of challenge and another mission, which was Newcastle. That said, how disappointed were you that your test career ended there? For me, like I said, I, I was a realist. Uh, I remember Peter calling me and giving me a call just before the tri Nation, saying that um, he's decided to, to go this route and this is the players that he's taking. And I said, you know what? Peter, I, I'm grateful for, I mean, it's the first time getting a call from a Springbok coach to tell you that you haven't made the squad, which is not the call that you want. Uh, but you take that with a pinch of salt and you say to yourself, at least that is respect. Uh, I've got loads of respect for Peter. Uh, he was my SNR 19 coach when he made me captain. So I had a long relationship with him since we were young. Uh, and I respect the man as who he is. And I, I took it that, okay, fine. Um, this is the best opportunity for me because, I mean, you are in the window from starting a test match to sign overseas, which is 18 months from that start of that test match. So I was like, at least thanks for giving me a start. <laughs> at least now I can um, forge my way and go play overseas. Barney, you played under Rudolf Strauli, you played under Jake White, as well as Peter de Villiers from a Springbok perspective. Talk to me about the three men and the differences in their coaching philosophies as you experienced it. I guess I'll have to start with uh, the man who gave me my first Springbok Cup, um, uh, Rudolf Strali. Rudolf Strali, um, very different sort of individual. Um, he had come back from England after being a director of rugby at Bedford. And, and he had different plans and he was very successful in 2001 with the Sharks taking them all the way to Super Rugby Final whilst they lost to uh, Brummies uh, in Bruce Stadium. Um, so, so he was a breath, uh, fresh air. Uh, I think everyone wanted something that from the Springboks. It was not the best of times. Um, after 99, there were a lot of senior players who had retired from Gary Tashman's. I mean, you can mention, uh, a whole list of players who were quite integral in, in, in the Springbok culture. So there's a lot of junior young players who were coming in, uh, trying to claim and, and make that work for them. Um, so he had a, he had a massive, uh, sort of, challenged in the, in the fact that there was there was Western Province, there was the Stormers, there was the Sharks, there was the Lions, there was the Bulls, and, and most of those teams were not doing well in the Super Rugby too. So he had to sort of up the ante and, and get the peop, uh, the players back into the best of mental um, aptitude they can get themselves into. But it was a struggle because there's a lot of junior young players not experienced Um he was very different in the way that he, he worked and, and how he saw the team and how his rugby philosophy was a uh, very hard-nosed man. Um, he really believed in the forward dominance and, and how he can use uh, the, the athletic backs to sort of finish it off. But it, it, it was a struggle because confidence is built from performances that are strong and and. Uh, and, out, and outwitting the opposition. So he really, I could say he got he was in there, so pulling the short stick uh, of Springbok talent, but then at the same time, it's the same guys that who started it in 2003, went on to be 2007, beat the British Irish Lions 2009. So he had those uh, those men at 
when they were still boys. So that 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 is what I, my take for him. Uh, I've known Jake um, ever since as a as a youngster. I remember he went and uh, tried to get me to go to JP Boys uh, uh, Boys for a high school for boys um, in Johannesburg. Uh, gave my dad a letter saying that they would be very interested to bring me over there. I decided to go the other route. I went to Rondebosch. Um and uh, we built a, 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 a bit of a strong bond with Jake. Um, uh, I worked with him uh, in his high performance squads uh, as he was in, in, in Cape Town as a, a still then as an analyst for the Springboks. Um, Jake White gave me, there was a time when I stopped playing rugby, I became a raster. Jake White gave me the 50 bucks that cut my head so that I could start playing rugby again. So I had that sort of uh, background with Jake and um, I still sort of value his opinion. Uh, I value his friendship. I value his mentorship as a, as a senior uh, a statesman in, in our country and someone that I can respect the opinion of when it comes to rugby. Jake was a, a very uh, witty coach. Um, he had that sort of stance of a, a school teacher. He knew how to get the best out of uh, of the culture and, and he knew the South African boy, what really drives them. Uh, and, and that's what he brought from 2004. Uh, you could see the players starting to really believe in, 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 in what was said and, and what was given to them. Uh, he brought a lot of uh, structure and um, a lot of direction to, to how we played the game. And... Um, and, and 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 a big disciplinarian, and and that worked out because we you had these young men coming to the sort of uh, point when they're becoming something big, and he had to make sure that he can keep everyone humble and at the same time make them as ambitious as possible. So that was the experience that and I've always had with Jake and then Peter De Villiers, like I mentioned, he was my first um, a national coach in SN19. He made me his captain. I remember sitting back and, and him and I speaking about when he was about to make that appointment and then now meeting him a few years later at the spring of level. Uh, so we had that constant sort of respect of, uh, and mutual respect of each other and uh, knew each other's abilities. Uh, one thing that Peter is, um, he's a great uh, man manager. Um, Peter did something which I don't think maybe the first two coaches will have done. Uh, before a test match, we played against Wells. Uh, Bucky Porter. Uh, his wife was expecting at that time and and Peter said you know the most important thing is family before anything and for me you can stay at home because you never know when the time is going to come for you to be there to become a father and I don't want you to miss those moments I want you to be there for support of your wife and I thought it was big of him because he thought about the individual more than thinking just about the game and, and that made everyone comfortable because you knew that you existed you were seen um, the emotional intelligence that he showed for me was something that uh, I think he, he can walk around with his head held up high because he he handed over the, the ownership back to the players uh, in terms of how they want to play. Um, he was coaching world champions. Uh, Peter has got a very uh, quick way of, of, of putting his points across. And it worked for the players because what it did is just took off all the pressure from them. Um, the only thing that the players had to do was to execute on the field and and knew that uh, Peter would run the circus of the media. Many kids grow up in South Africa dreaming of playing for the Springboks. And I think that those kids have it in their minds that they're going to play for a decade. They're going to play 100 test matches. But in your case, and many others actually, you only played six test matches. What's your advice to youngsters? Well, for me, the, the biggest thing is um, rugby doesn't define you. Uh, playing for the Springboks is, is a privilege for you. Um, everyone has got a number. Um, you think about it, only 30 players go to a World Cup. And that's out of thousands and thousands of players that go through. Um, for you to play HS schools, for you to represent your country at um, Sevens, South African A side, or just to be recognized as one of the top players for that weekend, just to be called out to play. It's, it's something that you should treasure and you should take to heart and don't take it for granted because I remember when um, uh, Brayton Parcel got his 60th cap and when he was getting his 50th cap and then the, and he was, I said to him, I think I still had about four test caps. I was like, oh, I'm 46 behind you. That's going to be a long haul to get there. And the one thing that he said, he says, you know what, I, I'm such privileged to be have these 50 caps because you never know if you ever going to play a game so every last game uh, play it as if it's your last one because it just gives you another chance to play the next one 
So who was your toughest opponent? Toughest opponent was uh, Tana Omanga. Um, I had good tassels with him at test match level and at super rugby level. Um, I guess the affinity of having dreads and having to play against him. Uh, and then uh, him and uh, my ma and Nunu made a great combination, a great place to test yourself and, and to see what skill set. I enjoyed the way that he played rugby. I enjoyed the way that he expressed the game. And, and I wanted to, to, to match and better that. And, and we really, uh, I really enjoyed playing against him. And I thought he was a, a very good player. I um, mean, it just shows uh, we went to become an uh, all-black legend, uh, moving from wing to center and becoming a leader uh, and starting some something very special for New Zealand. I ask this of all of my guests. Is there a particularly funny moment that you can share with us from your time with the Springboks? Uh, they, they, there's loads. Uh, sometimes you never know if it's, uh, it's PG or not. <laughs> um, I just think... The one, the one, the one, uh, sort of quirky or not even quirky. It was just something that happened. Uh, when Camp Staldrot and we were having it tough, uh, it was about second day and all the boys were chafing and the lips were cracked and, and everything was just not looking good. And I remember because I've known biker sporters since we were under 17 playing SS schools together and SN19 tours. And he looked at me and says, Bobs, I really understand now why you are an African and you stay in Africa because we are suffering here and you just giving a nice go. And, and I thought that for him, just to be in that mindset, because I know Bikis is always looking for like a little chirp and a little chat. Uh, and it was just like releasing the pressure that he was feeling at the time. But it was, it was quite nice to, to share those kind of moments in when it was uh, pretty much a dark time. Now, Kobani, I know that you are also an author. You've authored a thriller. Have you got uh, Ian Fleming ambitions by any chance? Not really. I mean, um, for me, it was by chance that came about. Uh, we sat around with um, my co-writer uh, and, um, and we said, you know, I said to him that when I was at school, I think I read one or two books because of the content. Uh, I wanted something that if I was at school, I could sit around and be like, okay, I'm into sports, I'm into rugby, I'm into this. Um, what would I want to read? And, and it's the best way to, to talk to someone's passion by giving them a bit of uh, literature. And, and, and that was my sort of uh, contribution towards that. And obviously, we've seen you on the TV quite a bit uh, over the last few years. What else are you up to these days? Um, in these days... Um, being a father, uh, father of two, which I'm very proud of. Also being my eldest and my, my second born, being Honor. So started a company called Honor and Grace, which is a female-led uh, uh, content creative uh, agency, sports agency. We want to tell stories about the heroines. I feel that if we can give the female um, heroines the same visibility and, and the same sort of attention uh, and get to introduce them to, to the public and to the world at large so that there could be pathways for, for younger uh, girl child who is out there who, who wants to express themselves in a sporting field and to feel comfortable being in that space and to alleviate all of the sort of uh, negativity that is around that and, and to, to take away the victimization, to, to bring out the, how hard they work and how beautiful is their work and how amazing is their skill set and how far reaching this could go, especially if we can start connecting those dots. All right, Kobani, we're going to finish off with the trivia question again. The Springboks did not play a single test match in 2020. In which previous year did that most recently happen? Do you know the answer? I'm not too sure. Um, I, the only thing I could think of will be 1991 before 92 were brought back. That is exactly right, 1991. That is the last time that the Springboks did not play a test match in a year, obviously with readmission coming in 1992. Uh, Kobani, let me say it was lovely having you on Front Row Rugby today. An absolute pleasure chatting to you. And hopefully we can have you on again in the future. Thank you so much, Peter. And to all your uh, followers and, and all your viewers, uh, please uh, keep on supporting the game. Let's make it grow. Let's make it bigger. Um, Let's make sure that we can create an environment where we can make better people. It's not just about being a springbok, it's about being a better South African.
Last time on Front Row Rugby, 1995 Rugby World Cup winner Peter Hendricks was my guest. You can go and watch that video. It's appearing on your screen right now. Next time, Audrey Geldenes will be here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed that video, why not spear tackle the like button? You can also subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any content from Front Row Rugby. See you next time.